Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Dr Ewan Lawson. Hi Ewan. Hi, yeah. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. So very exciting day today. So Ewan is a British medical doctor and a fellow of the Royal College of General Practitioners. He's ex-British Army and enjoys fell running. He's also my co-writer for The Healthy Writer, Reduce Your Pain, Improve Your Health and Build a Writing Career for the Long Term. And we're so excited to bring it to you, aren't we, Ewan? Yeah, I, I'm feeling I am buzzing a bit today already. It's not just the coffee. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> proper excited. We are and uh, we think it's a good book and today we're going to tell you about it. So start off Ewan by telling us a bit more about your background as it relates to writing and also what yeah. kind of doctor are you so people understand yeah, yeah. a bit more. Um, so as you said there I'm a GP, a general practitioner so that'll be familiar to people in UK and Australia and Canada but in the rest of the world it's not necessarily well known and we might be known as a specialist in family medicine or family physicians. And so basically we, we look after everyone outside of hospitals in the community. So it's kind of cradle to the grave stuff um, from the very from birth to babies, to kids, end of life um, um, and, and everything in between as well. So um, and I, I've done a lot of work as well with people who have addictions in the past, um, uh, particularly to uh, alcohol, but heroin, crack, amphetamines and people who inject drugs. So that's been a real kind of special interest of mine. Yeah. Um, and I, get, I guess most of my medical writing has been my writing has been medical in the past and particularly related to those special interests as well and about habits and addictions. So I've written for academic publications and textbooks and um, I've just finished a textbook about burnout in uh, doctors as well. Um, and I'm the editor of a medical journal. So um, obviously there's lots of writing involved in that and editing. Um, and we get lots of articles from people also about the experience, the lived experience of illnesses, whether it's from the doctor perspective or whether it's from the patient perspective as well. Um, so uh, lots of involvement on that medical side. Uh, I'm also a big fan of crime fiction. And um, I write a little bit of that myself and I help out reviewing um, the Crime Fiction Lover website. So that's I'm really I'm passionate about that. Um, so that's a lot of um, that's a lot of fun as well. So my, my writing sort of crosses across the spectrum. Yeah, I guess. No, that's fantastic. And then tell us, like, because you live in quite a cool place in Britain and, and also just, you know, give us an indication of your family as well, because it's yeah, not yeah, just yeah. you, is it? So, yeah, I, so well, the great thing about these sort of these jobs these days is you can work remotely. And so even though the kind of medical journal or other things are based in London, I'm able to live up in Cumbria, which is just um, in the Lake District. So that's up in the northwest corner of England. And um, it is a beautiful place. And I mean, I don't know how well it is well known it is globally, but it's a pretty fantastic spot. And I, I live on the side of a hill with my family um, so I can get out running regularly. Um, my wife enjoys the running out there and I occasionally drag out the kids. But to be honest, it's more common for my um, my lovely sprocker spaniel mini to come with me she's my <laughs> regular companion and she she's the one that keeps me honest yeah which is which is awesome and uh, you have some lovely pictures of you running around the area don't you so that that will give your website later but it's really yeah, sure. I, I think it's great to, to see that so um the book uh, the healthy writer obviously um and we we started off the book saying why writing is absolutely amazing for your health. And that's what I want us to start this interview with as well, because, you know, we will get on to some of the pain, yeah. but let's just focus yeah, yeah. first. So why is writing amazing for our health? Well, I mean, I, there is there's a bit of medical evidence around this. And I, I think you're right. There's a real there's a real potential for us to portray it as always bad. And actually, most people just get an enormous amount out of their writing. And, and there's some quite good evidence for writing as therapy. I think um, you've written about, and I find personally, it gives you such great insight into your own thought processes and how you, that works with your own emotions. And that's the kind of basis of things like cognitive behavioral therapy. And so you're on, I see writing as kind of a start to those kind of, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and there's some quite good studies that have shown, even with a simple thing like a gratitude journal, you, and even just once a week, writing down five things weekly, there were some California psychologists who had a great study that showed, actually it really massively improved personal well-being. And people people felt much better. And it wasn't just that they said they felt good and it was kind of, you know, it was a, the, the family members noticed it as well. It was a really sort of objective thing. And, and so there's that kind of psychological mental health aspect to writing, which I think is great. But actually, they went the research has gone a little bit further as well. And um, it can actually help your physical health. And I think because of those improvements in your mental health, that can improve your sleep. And um, getting your sleep right can be a bit of a superpower. And um, if you get your sleep wrong, it leads to a lot of problems, you know, stress, and that releases cortisol and other sort of hormones which can damage your health in the long run. 
So actually writing can be really positive in terms of improving all those things. And, and if you're following your passion, it's hard to see how that's bad for your health anyway. And I think it's tremendously good for you. Exactly. Um, it's funny you say sleep is a superpower. I mean, people always ask how I get stuff done. And I generally say, because I sleep for like eight or nine hours a night. <laughs> And then I just have, I'm so full of energy that I just get stuff done. But um, it, also on the writing good for our health, like the, the social side, for example, you know, when I started yeah, writing yeah. In, in, two, in 2006, I, I knew nobody creative, like creative in, in the sense that, you know, now I'm in the center of this community, uh, my own community and, and many others. And it's interesting because by putting our writing out in the world, whether that's books, journals, blogging, social media, yeah. we can actually connect with people like us and that loneliness and isolation that yeah. some people feel is also mitigated yeah i think that's really important i know we'll probably mention that a bit further on in terms of loneliness because i just think it's one of those incredibly important aspects and if you're connecting with people that is something you feel passionate about you know you connect with people at work or other things but when it's your passion and you connect with people and make those um, and have those social interactions that, that's amazingly good for you and i think you know that really you know it's a real benefit Okay, so let's get into the survey then, because we had nearly 1,200 writers submit answers yeah. to the Healthy Writer Survey in August 2017. And there were some heartbreaking stories. I mean, we both read through reams and reams of, of stories about pain mm. and problems. So what are the most common problems, you know, overarching that authors face? And did, did anything stand out for you? Yeah, I mean, well, a few things. I mean, the first thing was, it was just, it was an incredible privilege uh, and an incredible response from the community. Uh, so there was so much to go through and um, people willing to share kind of like really difficult moments and also sharing their hard learned lessons as well. And they, and it, they did it with such generosity uh, that, that people have been through that pain and just wanted to actually help other people improve their health a little. I think there was a lot of stuff there I expected, which was back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain. Um, there was a lot about inactivity and not getting moving enough and people who'd gained weight as a result, particularly if they'd kind of gone into being writers full time and had suddenly noticed there were some very obvious stories about people who had suddenly gained weight and could see immediately the, um, the problems that their writing had given them. Um, there were some things I didn't expect, which I possibly should have done, which things like eye strain and headaches and use of computers. Um, and there were there were also a lot of um, stories um, and quite moving stories about mental health and the, the loneliness and isolation. Um, and um, I don't suppose I suppose they didn't surprise me because I know that that's a big problem. But when you read about them, it's always more affecting. Um, and particularly I see, you know, as a GP, you see people one person at a time. And you see, you know, when you actually then read about dozens of stories all along that theme, it, it was very um, it was very affecting. Mm. And we include a lot of the quotes that people gave us their permission for mm. in the book. And some of the beta readers we've had have said that it, it's helped them feel less alone because they realise lots of other people suffer this. And I think that's a big problem as writers. We spend so much time alone um, that we think, oh, this is just, uh, you know, must be accepted and must be just me or whatever. But actually, there's lots of ways you can deal with it. So I did I did want to um, sort of look about some of the, the different things uh, that we wrote because it's not an academic book and that was quite challenging for you I think and we'll come back to your writing yeah, yeah. process um, but um, pain and health in layers is something that really helped me as we were writing it's like sure your back hurts but what might that mean and I share my own five-year journey of you know going through lots of different ways of dealing with back pain so what have been some of your personal health issues uh, over the last few years and how did writing the book help you to sort of face up to them and and sort of share that yeah. Um, so I guess one of the, I was, I, you know, I, I was, I've been thinking about this through the book and one of the biggest things for me has been exercise. And I, I've been very lucky in terms of my physical health and I've not had any sort of significant problems. And I guess we're actually getting to the stage of writing this book is because actually some of the issues I've had, I've, you know, have managed to address in, in some ways. Um, I, my, I didn't, I didn't come from a very active family. So I, I got into my twenties and didn't really have any process for doing exercise. A very podgy runner at school, generally humiliated in the school cross country. <laughs> Though I was sort of did the sports, I was rubbish at running. Um, but I always loved being in the mountains and being outdoors. And then when I got into my twenties, I really learned how to learned how to run and spent time with people who valued exercise in itself. And so kind of my personal health challenge is I, I learned how to exercise and how to enjoy running in particular. But I, what I couldn't do was make it a habit and do it regularly. And I just kept falling off the wagon and I'd have three months where I do no exercise and then you have to try to get back to it. And actually, so one of the biggest challenges for me is about has been, has been making exercise 
you know, just embedded in my life. It's, it feels weird not to do it. Um, and that is really in the last three or four years. And so writing the book, I've become very aware that, that actually that's kind of um, that's been my journey in terms of where I am now and that kind of satisfaction and quality of life I get from being able to exercise regularly. Mm. Um, I, I think in terms of challenges for the future, I, I have still not managed to sort my back out. Um, despite and all the advice there and your and fantastic story about your back and your kind of your path to a pain free back um, via yoga mostly uh, that's still one that I'm struggling to do and I actually I'm trying to get a habit and I'm wrestling with that every day ah uh, well that's interesting and I just want to comment on food because I have a letter to sugar in the book yeah, that yeah. is actually pretty hard for me to share um, and it's quite personal and you know we do talk about the weight gain but it's hilarious we're having this conversation and on the video behind you I can see a, a, a box of quality street and a bottle of wine <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd like to say they've been there for years, and the, bo the box is definitely empty. I've eaten them all. <laughs> and and I think it's important to say um, that this is not a weight loss book at all. It's about health, and we do touch yeah. on weight because that is a problem that people have. But in no way, you know, it's about health. So we do yeah, yeah. have some stuff. But I just wanted to, you know, say to people, both of us enjoy our food, and we enjoy, you know, yeah, yeah. eating stuff. Uh, so it's not like a luxury book. I, I hope people find it more useful yeah i certainly hope not i i think my I, you know I, my diet can be diabolical at times and I, I have a real problem with crisps it's really my biggest failing <laughs> oh, what do they call them in america um our oh, chips potato chips potato, potato, potato chips yeah. yeah yeah that's my biggest failing so yeah absolutely i, I, I that'll never go away but it's about managing those it's about managing it isn't it <laughs> yeah and it's funny like i've got some quotes in there about black coffee and i'm standing here with with black coffee uh, i mean you know and it, yeah. these, these things are fine and and it's about how we incorporate things in our healthy life so just wanted to point that out. So yes. um, coming back to, like I just said, I'm standing up. Both of us are actually standing up right now, aren't we? Yeah, I'm standing, yeah. Yeah, in our standing desks. And improving our workspaces is probably one of the most critical things, or at least something to start with. So for example, it, with back pain, one of the things that, to look at is your ergonomics, like immediately. Yeah. And I had terrible RSI for about two years that eventually was sorted with my back pain through yoga and various other yeah. things. So what are some tips for improving our workstation health? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned RSI because we've obviously got a bit about it in the book, but I don't think it came up as much as we expected, perhaps in the survey as a problem. But um, I, I think that's because I think it comes up in other ways as well. In terms of back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, it's all linked. Arm pain. I don't know if people know yeah. that RSI is repetitive strain injury, which is yeah. like a diagnosis of pain, isn't it? Well, that's well, that's exactly. It doesn't say much more than that. You just get pain from doing something, and that's pretty much what RSI is. It's really not terribly sophisticated, but and I. I, I I think so. You need a really a holistic approach to that, and actually, hopefully, if you can not get it in the first place. Um, so, in terms of basic tips, using laptops is perhaps one of the things to be really careful of. They're fairly toxic from in ergonomic terms, and they contort your body into horrible positions. And you look down at the screen when really you should just be looking more level or slightly down at your screen. So, actually, getting a, a riser or sticking it even on a few magazines or books is really good for your laptop, and using an external keyboard. So that's a kind of probably basic advice for laptops, which is really important because they can really hurt people. Um, and then I think it's about things like your chair and your sitting position. You, you want to have a sort of a normal curve of your spine, if you can, where your lower back curves slightly in um, and um, a generally relaxed position so that your head is just kind of looking straight across. Your arms are generally parallel to the floor um, and not usually resting on the desk or the keyboard. They should just slightly be in a relaxed, neutral position hovering above your keyboard. Um, feet on the floor can help actually rather than crossing your feet and sticking them out in front of you that can be a helpful sort of just simple ergonomic tip um, and a, a good chair will often help you achieve that and remind you and some people use foot rest as well to keep their feet in the right position mm. and I think that's all the sitting down side of things there's a lot of good evidence around the standing desks and treadmills desks um, and I was really struck by some of the evidence around this that showed that they can be really they can be really beneficial and improve well-being. The, the treadmill desks are really interesting. And you could, with people actually showing improvements in their blood work, in their blood test result, having better their uh, glucose improving, so less chance of diabetes and their cholesterol levels improving. The only slightly weird thing about treadmill desk is trying to type when you're on one. <laughs> always seems like a seems like a desperate task and that has been measured in the research as well and it did show there is a slight reduction in um typing speed and a slight reduction in your ability to kind of do complex tasks but mm -hmm. it was pretty minor 
And um, the, probably the benefits of exercise would offset that anyway. Yeah, and I so. think uh, I interviewed Russell Blake, who is an incredibly prolific indie author. Mm. Uh, he, I think he walks on his treadmill desk like eight hours a day and he's yeah. writing the entire time. So I think, um, and I've, I've heard people say that you do have to start off walking very slowly, but that <laughs> you obviously get used to it. But um, the treadmill desk is not practical for most people. Neither you or I actually have a treadmill desk, right? I mean, no. um, yeah. It's just, for me, it's not practical in a small apartment. And I also tend to yeah. write in cafe. So just, um, yeah. I'll describe what's ha what I am doing right now. And in the blog post that goes with this, we're gonna have some pictures of us in our various working positions. So I'm standing up right now and I've got a, um, a it's called a Humble Works stand. It's like a wooden stand. I did have a desk that, with a motor that went up and down, but the motor broke. So I love this oh. wooden stand. So I, I've constructed it on top of my desk and then I can take it down really easily. Um, I have my laptop on top of it with um, the keyboard when I'm typing lower down so I can keep my posture. I've got a Swiss ball with, when I'm sitting and I've yeah. got a footrest for my Swiss ball uh, as well to kind of, because otherwise you yeah. can, you know, I cross tend to cross my legs. And the Swiss ball, I do a lot of back bends over and I find the the actual arms over the head stretch um, is, is just critical for the pain I get between my shoulders and which affects affected my RSI. Yeah. So that's basically my sort of setup. So tell people what, what your setup is, because well, when you're a GP, I mean, you're like, you know, at a desk yeah. as well. Yeah, the GP is really awkward. And I actually often end up with a very sore back because and I have met GPs who are starting to do some consultations standing up as well or have a, a desk that will go up and down because they're getting so many problems. And my desk here is at the university um, and it is actually it's a stand up desk, but it's an old school desk, like looks like a Victorian thing for a children's school desk that I cut the legs off of. <laughs> and I put I, I, I bought a chunk of MDF off of eBay. What's MDF? And I, MDF is like sort of this, um, you know, very thick fiberboard kind of stuff. So it's kind of a piece of wood. It's about an inch and a half thick. So it's really heavy. And I just plunked it on top. And, and I, I cut the legs to exactly the right height. And so I've got my arms in a nice neutral position when I'm at the keyboard and the, um, the screen at the back of the piece of MDF. And then it's not bolted together in any way. It just sits there and the weight just holds it in position. And if, if I try and lean on it, which is obviously bad anyway, it does move a little. So that discourages me from leaning on it because otherwise my <laughs> computer will fall off. So, but um. It, so it cost me next to nothing mm. and it works really well. But I, I have it on the corner of the desk, so I can also vary my posture a little because I think that's probably quite important. Some some standing, I know that there's some evidence that if you're standing all the time, that can irritate your back as well. So a bit of variation in posture is really useful. So I've got the other end of my desk where I can sit normally. And I also have a Swiss bowl that I will then sometimes use if I just want a bit of a change with that yeah. as well. That's fantastic. The, stu the, the students laugh at me if I'm on the Swiss bowl, so I don't tend to use that so often. <laughs> Well, I think I think this is really good because I mean neither of us have a very expensive setup. I mean the laptop's no. pretty expensive for most of yeah, us, but yeah. that's an important tool. But there's the, you can get these basic pieces of equipment to change things up quite easily. Um, yeah, that, yeah. And I also wanted to ch uh, check in with you on dictation because we have a mm. chapter on dictation in the book, um, and I certainly dictated like the first draft of what I was thinking for the book, um, and yeah. some of the chapters you know were based on a dictated first draft. So how about you how have you felt with dictation um i've well, yeah I've, I've been using it more and more in the past year and um all of my first draft stuff i dictated as well so however many words that was i did it all on dictation obviously once we got past that stage the dictation wasn't a problem but i, I also moved very quickly away from dictating with the computer screen in front of me and went mm -hmm. to mobile devices and i found that really helped um in terms of just getting into the flow of dictation and um not um uh, not correcting as you go and your little inner editor starting to panic um, about things. And that's worked really well. And I run it off my Mac just using a, um, using, uh, I don't use parallels. I use a, a free equivalent of parallels to run Dragon on my Mac. Mm. And that's worked brilliantly. What I would say is I noticed that actually, interestingly, Dragon has incredible accuracy for medical stuff. And I think there's a professional version of Dragon, which is used by a lot of medics. I think not so much in Britain, but certainly overseas. And it, it recognizes all the medical words. It is absolutely, it's a ninja when it comes to medical stuff. So it worked really well. <laughs> That's awesome. If only they would do that for like fantasy novels. Because yeah, yeah, I hear yeah. from fantasy authors, they're like, yeah, no, it's very difficult. <laughs> they must um, have a nightmare, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then like, I've really noticed, like I felt in the writing of this, I have like when I'm at the cafe, because I write fiction at the mm. cafe. And 
I take the laptop and I am in a bad position. But what I've started to do a lot is try and stand up more um, in between. So if I'm editing, I'll stand up to read and yeah. try and ignore people looking at me now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, because basically that's part of my process and this is obviously yeah. very important in the book when what we're not trying to do is like okay you must do that it's like what yeah, are the yeah. ways in which you can improve your process so you're not suffering so much pain and you can do this for the long term yeah yeah i think that's right and i think the, well, the tip that came out through the survey almost all the time was about breaks and structured breaks mm. and so you do something a little bit different and i think almost all of the problems that you could you can have writing if you take a break probably but people vary so you need to find your own process but say every 30 minutes actually even stopping for a couple of minutes to stretch and and particularly eye strain or get your eyes away from the screen not to use it to look at your phone to actually do something a little bit different actually really that's really good to kind of um, that's a, I think that's a big part as well of a, of a healthy process. Mm. So, I mean, what was funny, I, well, not funny, it was kind of going to happen, is that it's not rocket science. We all know this, uh, you know, that the evidence for good sleep, good diet, good exercise are important for health, resilience and longevity. And I think one of the things that I realised in doing this writing is that I've spent so long concentrating on what's above my neck, you know, the importance <laughs> of my brain and just focusing yeah, yeah. on my brain. And my body was literally something that carries my brain around and it just needs to carry my brain around but actually in reading a lot yeah i know it's crazy but i've really and we we talked about nootropics which are drugs yeah, yeah. that can make your brain go faster um and you know empower your brain and what what i learned from you and from doing all this is that if you sleep well eat well and exercise well you actually have a much better brain right yeah yeah i think that's right they are they, they are probably they're they're good proven uh, cognitive enhancers in that regard they, they get your they really improve your brain I, I think you're right but i mean there is a danger this could be a very short book as well <laughs> in terms of getting those things sorted but it, we know what the good things are and mm. there's really good evidence for them but it is tremendously difficult and there is a bit of a paradox as well because i mean the secret to being a writer is getting your butt in the chair and writing but the secret to being healthy is probably getting out of the chair and being active so there is a bit of a kind of a you know there is a bit of a contradiction there mm. so working at that is difficult and most people know that stuff's bad for them it's like smokers as well you know people know smoking's not good for them you don't need to tell them but actually stopping's a whole changing your habits is a very different um uh, kettle of fish mm. you changing that kind changing things that are deeply entrenched are really hard, is really hard to do and i think uh, we have lots of pressures in the world around us to keep on doing the things we're doing whether it's family or work or uh, you know, and also just out in the world, and I've been very, felt very strongly about this, that actually the world is trying to make us consume as well in terms of eating snacks and eating more than we're used to. And we, we need to push back against that a little. Mm. Uh, and we need to try and recognize what those habits are so that we can start to make some changes. Yeah, definitely. The habits are a really good thing. I mean, you, you talk there about, you know, some of the things that we're encouraged to do. And I think what's become interesting in the indie author community is this emphasis on high production, which yeah. is stressing people out and, and people are burning out. And you mentioned at the beginning yeah, yeah. working on burnout in doctors. So for those, yeah. you know, what, what are some of your tips for anyone feeling overwhelmed, burned out, losing the, and someone actually put in the survey that they were losing their love for writing because yeah. of this emphasis on on production i think um well there's lots of different aspects to burnout and there's lots of different ways to make yourself more resilient as well and some of those good things we've talked about already in terms of your health will really make a huge difference to making you um uh, more resilient and less prone to burnout I, I think the one thing i would probably point to is the problem of comparisonitis and i we, i talk about that a little bit more in terms of being active in the book but it works for writing as well of course is that um you really have to live your own life and on your own terms and actually the and the, that's part of the thing about the book is not trying to tell you to do you know i talk about running a lot but i don't think running is absolutely not the answer for everybody the right exercise is the one you want to do and um I think you've got to probably take that approach to writing and burnout as well. Actually, you know, comparisonitis can, is really toxic and it can lead you into a very bad place if you're doing something which works against you and doesn't fit with your normal patterns. That adds to stress and all those stress levels, they lead to, you know, they affect your sleep, that affects your health. It makes it harder to do the right things. It makes it harder to make healthy habit changes as well. Mm. And so you can very quickly go down a very unpleasant little rabbit hole with with that kind of process and, and also i think one of the things we emphasize is is trying to get in touch with your body more and again like i feel that this is yoga mm. has helped me with this too is this mind body connection which as i 
pretty much ignored what my body was telling me. And, you know, yeah. my, my husband has always said, I don't stop until I hit the wall. And when I hit the yeah. wall, like then I stop because I'm forced to, or my, I suddenly get, you know, I, when I do get really bad headaches now and they're quite rare, it's because I've, I have, I haven't stopped working for, for yeah. ages and I love my work. I absolutely love what I do, but my health can suffer. So I think rest and like you said, taking breaks is not just the five minutes in between working sessions it's also you know a, a day off a digital fast it's a week yeah. off away from the computer it's take facebook off your phone <laughs> yeah yeah no, well, absolutely and there's, i think there's a balance to all these things and i think uh, people fear the loss of productivity and i think there's certainly at least one quote in the book if not others about that someone would you know somebody who's very anxious about that time away from uh, time away from writing to exercise very rarely causes that much of a productivity impact if it keeps you going longer Actually, when you come back to it and you're, you're, you're refreshed and you're working well, then actually you're, you're going to be just as productive. You know, losing the sort of the few minutes to do those healthy things or to connect in some other way or to take a break and, or to go out and be mindful. And mindfulness is a really mm. um, growing evidence base for how useful that can be as well. And I think they, they can all help really um, build, a, build a writing habit which, will sustain, which you can sustain in the long term. Uh, so what's interesting too is we don't just talk about um, physical health we're also talking about mental health and I was quite saddened by the loneliness and isolation that some people felt and also a lot of people mention depression and anxiety which is relatively common in the normal population I say normal population in the population right yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you talked about you know how some of you know comparisonitis brought up some anxiety for you and I have a whole chapter on my mental health uh journey i guess and we have dan holloway who wrote a, a great yeah, chapter yeah, great. i mean he's bipolar so he has um you know depressive yeah. episodes and he wrote a great chapter we have stuff on chronic pain that often causes these things so what are some ways in which writers can i guess uh, identify and then help with this issue and find a community yeah so I, there's a quite a big spectrum of possibilities there I, because i mean and obviously loneliness is not a a kind of end of the spectrum of depression and anxiety but they're often closely linked mm. so i think one of the first things is kind of really identifying what your difficulties are in yourself and it's about kind of self-awareness thing and writing itself can be really good for that to actually work out what you're thinking and how you're feeling and i know that it's been said that you know sitting is the new smoking but really actually probably loneliness is the new smoking really in terms of it being really bad for your health to be socially isolated not have a community so um, there are some sort of simple ways you can go on. There's some simple questionnaires, but actually just thinking about whether or not you've got somebody you can confide in is an important um, uh, aspect of whether or not you could be lonely. Um, and then obviously we, there's talk, we talk in the book about how you can find your community, how you could engage with people, friends, dating, other things in terms of getting out and meeting people and doing those sort of things. Um, depression and anxiety, that, obviously that can be very closely associated with those. Um, and there are, I think if things are obviously going too far the wrong way, then you're going to need to speak to a healthcare professional to kind of, then there may be other sort of more specific treatments that you need, and that's really important. But actually sometimes at the lower levels, there's an awful lot you can do yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And so we mentioned writing there, sometimes the talking therapies can be really helpful. Um, and you can do some of the sort of cognitive behavioral therapies. You can do those, um, you can do them online, you can do them over the telephone. You don't actually have to go and see a therapist necessarily. So they're quite accessible and they can be really helpful to establish how your can negative thought patterns can impact on your emotions, can impact on your mood and impact on sort of anxiety symptoms. Um, but I think the number one thing about mental health problems more than anything is um, getting out there you, and speaking to somebody and recognizing it and recognizing that you're not alone. I have conversations I have time after time after time in the surgery to people that are mental health problems and they feel guilty about having it. And they go, well, my, my life's not stressful. I shouldn't feel anxious, but it doesn't work. You know, mental health problems don't work like that. You wouldn't be saying that if you got a chest infection Mm -hmm. I don't. It just happens. There are just illnesses that happen to some people. But um, and actually we see I, I, the numbers, whatever they are, one in three will suffer a lifetime problems or something similar is that the surgeries are chock full of people who have the same problems, but are not speaking to each other and telling each other they have the same problems. So you spend your life in the surgery going, listen, you're really I, I've seen I've seen half a dozen people with this already today. This is and actually trying to reassure people that what they're experiencing is um, is OK. It does need some, you know, there are some specific actions in terms of um, getting some, whether it's talking treatments or even medication. Exercise is tremendously good. Doing all those sort of good things with cognitive enhancement, like exercise and, you know, being careful about alcohol in terms of how you use it. 
all of those things can um, really help push things in the right direction. Mm. And I think this is part of what we're trying to do is almost, you know, make people feel less alone in how they're feeling and try and open up these conversations. And I think we are coming into a point where, um, I mean, you and I have had this conversation. Women are generally better at identifying these and talking things and men often keep these things very quiet. And, um, you know, my my husband, Jonathan, uh, there's a chapter on uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome and anxiety. And I was like so grateful that he was sharing that because that's been a huge, huge issue in our in our life. And yeah, yeah. and it's and the digestive system and anxiety is so closely aligned. And also with, yeah, yeah. with authors, you know, sometimes the unhealthy diet can exacerbate these things. So I hope that mm. I hope that some of these difficult things to discuss, bodily functions, mental health, uh, you but, know, stuff that yeah, people yeah. hide can be more talked about. Yeah, well, with the digestive chapter is definitely a little bit more sort of scatological in that regard. So we kind of, and it's a fantastic chapter from Jonathan. And I think, you know, really open and so important that I actually very rarely see that from, from um, particularly from men, as you say, you know, kind of that honesty. And I think it's just, if we can get it out there and we can talk about it and actually we, we all know the stigma that is there with mental health mm. and people often put it on themselves. It's not as well as other people from the outside putting it on them. Um, if we can make people feel a little bit less alone and, feel that they, it's okay to go and get help and look after that side of their health. And I think that's going to be, mm. um, I'll be very happy. Yeah, me too. Okay, so we are, as this goes out, we're coming into a new year and it doesn't matter when you're listening, uh, viewers or listeners, um, how can we develop healthy habits for the coming year and make some changes for the long term? Because what we don't want is the sort of new year, let's just give up alcohol and be dry for January and then essentially go back to all the unhealthy stuff. So how can we, what are some of your tips for that, the habits? Yeah, so I think the important thing about habits is to recognise that a lot of them, they can be very good. We kind of, they're, they're there to sort of free up our brains to do other things. But you've got to be very careful that you don't want to live all your life on automatic pilot. <laughs> and actually, it's doing a little audit of those habits that's really important. And so that you kind of, you're, you're, sometimes you need to sit down and really identify what your bad habits are. So Because if you're doing them on automatic pilot, by definition, you, you're not even noticing sometimes that you're, in terms of why you're eating the snacks or why you're not getting the exercise or what's happening that's disrupting your sleep um, and I, I think I, the, the new year thing is a real problem I, I think because you go out and you make sweeping changes and they're unsustainable so more than anything I think the, the thing to understand is you need to change habits in the long term and changing habits is uncomfortable it, it, it does trigger a bit of stress you have that sort of cognitive dissonance where things don't feel quite right it's even like if you have a holiday you know, have a day off and then I'm at work on a Tuesday when I should have been there on a Monday I feel a bit weird it doesn't feel right and that's because my habits being disrupted and so actually my tips on this is really to make small, sustainable changes. And then you have to be persistent and you have to be patient. And it's going to take weeks and it's going to take months for those habits to get ingrained as the new habits. And it's going to take um, it's going to take a long time for the, the changes for, to come through. But you will then have hopefully sustainable changes to your lifestyle that you're not just going to bounce back again. I mean, there's a lot of good evidence about um, diets, for example, nowadays, and crash diets that people tend to bounce back um, and put as much weight back on again afterwards. And so I don't think that's, you know, that if it, when it comes to weight loss, that's certainly not a good approach. But when it comes to anything in terms of your health, I think small changes that you can sustain, incremental, that's, that, that's kind of the way to go. But first of all, you have to have the awareness. You have to know what they are. And so you've got to sit down and try and work that out. And it's interesting because, um, again, I put in the letter to Sugar, which I wrote in May 2017, um, mainly because I read a lot about the link with Alzheimer's. And I'm not scared of dying. I write about dying all the time. I'm scared of Alzheimer's and dementia mm. because my whole life is around things I create from my brain. And, and you know, I give to a charity um, on this. And when I read about the links between uh, sugar and Alzheimer's and some of these things and the, the health issues beyond weight, so forget about weight, I just wanted to give up sugar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my habit, like one of our habits as a couple would be to have our dinner and then go and watch some TV. And we would have like half a block of chocolate each in front of the TV. <laughs> and we would just do that like every night and not even think anything of it. And I was like, hmm. 
yeah, okay. <laughs> so e yeah. even just identifying that that yeah, was a yeah. habit, you know, sweet, sweet something in front of the TV after dinner as part of relaxing, needs, yeah, yeah. it was something that I need to do address as a habit and Jonathan yeah. also addressed it. So that's cool. But these, yeah, yeah. these little changes, um, and that ended up being quite significant. And then I also update the chapter in uh, a few weeks ago before we um, finished the book uh, mm -hmm. about how it's going. So I'll, I'll leave that, but it's definitely, you have to do kind of start with identifying, as you say, and then making small changes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, my, my, one of the habits I identified that really helped me, I, I kicked off about sort of a couple of, um, about 25, 30 pounds of weight, sort of, sort of 15 kilos a few years ago. And um, that made a big difference to how I felt in terms of my health. But one my habit there was that I would buy, um, I'd buy potato chips, crisps from the at the garage every time I filled up for petrol, and I would eat in the car on my commute to work, mm. backwards and forwards. And I and I wasn't even really appreciating that I was doing it. And it was only when I sort of sat, you know, I sat and worked it out and realised it was a real, that that, that was a real a, a real critical point and just by doing by changing that habit changing the routine a little and I chewed gum and bought gum whenever I had a lot of gum in the car for a long time <laughs> I, I chewed gum instead of eating so I had something to do with my mouth I had a bit of a reward while I was driving actually and I you know it was a real big factor in helping me address that habit Mm. So yes, we do. We do try and mix um, your evidence-based chapters and doctor-based chapters mm. with sort of um, experience and quotes from other people. So yeah, we hope yeah. the book's really useful. So I want to now come into talking about the actual writing process because yeah. um, the book was your idea, and um, I certainly would never yeah. have considered this. So why did you want to write this book, and why did you want to co-write with me? <laughs> And be honest, because we haven't actually talked about this before. <laughs> no, 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 I had that conversation. The, um, I, I think, um, well, it all came back to, I went on a course in November 2016 with yourself and how to make a living from your writing with yourself and Orna Ross in London back in November 2016. And um, I, I, I guess I wanted to write the book. I had lots of stuff on my hard drive littered around about fitness and health and other things. And I wasn't making the time. I was procrastinating. I was too busy. I was kind of had a bit of resistance and I was in the middle of a PhD. And Orna stood up at the end and said, um, what are you going to give up in terms of to do this? And I was like, I had a kind of a bit of a bit of an epiphany. I was like, I'm giving up my PhD and I'm, I'm stopping immediately. I'm going to do some writing, but the writing I really want to do. And so I came away and then I think Christmas went past and I gave up the PhD. And then in January, I was making some plans about what I was going to write. And I was kicking around a lot of ideas about healthy writing. And obviously I was listening to the podcast and I, I, I'm sure you must have been given out cues and you, you say I didn't have the idea, but I, you were kind of definitely um, putting out vibes, I think, about healthy writers and all the health issues that writers have. And I think that was partly because you were relating your own experiences. Mm. And so I had a kind of a I had a, a kind of a, a instant moment where I thought, actually, this could be a really this potentially could be something that actually would work as a pairing with yourself, with your experience and as a kind of um, obviously in that indie community. Um, and myself as a doctor. So um, I spent an hour writing a short email and just put it to you straight away. And I think you wrote back and said you're a believer in synchronicity about that the kind of thing because it had been occurring to you. So I think it was it wasn't an idea that just flat. It was an idea that was kind of five or ten years for me in the in the baking. And there just came a moment where I suddenly thought, actually, this is this could really this potentially could work. But it was a bit of a gamble because I, obviously I didn't know you. I'd you know I'd been to. <laughs> I've listened to your podcast. I suppose to a certain extent, we all know you from your podcast because <laughs> you are very honest. But um, I, I, I had no idea whether it, would, it breaks all the rules of co-writing in that regard in terms of, you know, working. The One rule of co-writing is having a relationship already with your co-writer, your co-author. Mm. Um, and so I, I was really enthusiastic about the indie community. And that was really the way I wanted to go. And I've always said that when I did it. So that was obviously in your um, position within that community. It was a um, uh, it looked like a good fit. Mm. Well, and, and it's so interesting because, yeah, you you deciding to give up that PhD is huge, uh, is, a, is a huge thing. Um, and the fact that you were relieved to do it. And I think so often people try and do something like a PhD or they want to write a novel. So they enroll in an MFA or, you know, Masters yeah, in Creative yeah. Writing because they feel like another academic thing is the way to go. Um, but obviously yeah. you chose a different route uh, on reflection are you are you happy that you gave up the phd yeah i'm getting increasingly happy there's, there's still a bit of you know it was, it was a difficult decision afterwards because really i was giving up a, an academic career as well potentially so because mm. once you, if you without a phd you can't go down that academic track but i was reading stephen pressfield's book again um the, the pro one i forget the title of it turning pro 
turning pro just a, a couple of weeks ago. And I think it was very much what he would have called a shadow career. You know, you, pers you pursue that. I was pursuing something which was just about close enough that I thought I really wanted it, but actually it wasn't really what I wanted to do at all. It was just distracting me. And there are so many hours in the day and I realized that I was, I, I was losing the hours I needed to get something like this project going. And I think the other important thing there is that sometimes we have to make space in our life for something new to come in. So yeah. you actually have to give things up in order that new stuff will arrive. And yeah. I've really found that in the creative space. So just on the just to keep the story going. So you email me and I replied yeah. and then I basically said great idea but I don't know you and I don't know your writing so yeah, yeah. Um, how about you write a chapter and then I yeah. see if you are you know put your money where your mouth is basically yeah, yeah. so you wrote a chapter um, so so how did you feel about that uh, I'm extremely nervous obviously I'm super nervous I, I'm really anxious I, I, I think you're you're ex extremely um, uh, nice about it there was no there was no sort of pressure in that regard so but I was feeling very anxious about it and obviously I sent it in and you were like, well, you need to do this and that. It's far too bad. And that was my problem is that I'm kind of, you so had that academic writer so ingrained in me and I needed to really pull back from that. Even when I thought I was pulling back from it, I needed to go further in yeah. terms of um, uh, the type of writing that we were aiming at. Um, and so I rewrote it. And I, I think that probably, and then I think that was, that was part of, I guess that was part of that kind of um, process of, uh, we didn't have a relationship before. So actually just, working out whether we could fit mm. um, was in those first few months. Yeah, um, we, we got on Skype. I mean, we um, hmm. obviously we met last November and then we just met again like last weekend. Yeah, so yeah, in effect, the book, the whole book's been written without us having, you know, without ever really having met. Which is... <laughs> but we, we, we have had Skype meetings, so that's yes. important. And um, we also set up a, um, a Google Doc very early where we went through yeah. how we would work and or we also did a contract. Yeah, and I think the contract is really important because and I think and I know that you've talked about this and I think in your co-author book as well, the, the, um, and that, that, that was really useful and I was really positive about that. And it was very well written in terms of um, clarity of what was the expectations and what happened in the future. And mm -hmm. so that was all very, there, there was, uh, you know, there are always weird things that can happen, but most of them are taken care of within that. So actually there's much, far less chance of sort of dispute or disagreement down the line. Yeah, and it's so important because actually, you know, co-writing a book, it, I mean, it's pretty serious. Mm. I mean, it, it, if, it, if yeah, yeah. it becomes something and we do other editions or whatever, it can go on beyond both of our lifetimes. It's longer than marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, absolutely. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of crazy, but cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so it's amazing. So I, the contract, it was, it was really great in that regard. And we, you know, the, the table of contents were put together on the Google Doc and then we were able to talk about it on Skype. Mm. Um, before we got that first draft done, and that, that, I mean, obviously, I did. The, we did. Uh, I did my first draft, and that was a terrifying moment as well. Sending that in, I really struggled with that mm. because really, I just dictated and then sent some, done a little bit of tidying up, but very little. So it was extremely raw. And sharing that first draft stage, I found that was really challenging. Yeah, well, I remember the first time with Jay Thorne when I did Risen Gods and I sent him my first chapter and I was like, I hate this. I don't want you to see this. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> but it's, you know, it was important yeah. because I also, yeah, yeah. I also feel that, yes, you were, your, your, your voice was pretty academic. And uh, what I like in the book is I think it's kind of obvious, although we have added in markers as to who's yeah. speaking. But, you know, we do have different voices, but you have moved very much from where you started. And I think it was around March when you did that first chapter um, to now. And your, your voice has relaxed a lot. Yeah. Um, so basically you did that draft. Then um, we used Scrivener. Now we didn't write yeah. in Scrivener at the same time. So you took yeah, Scrivener yeah. and gave it a first bash, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so I think that's a, that's an interesting, interesting the way we use Scrivener, because I know that, say, for example, the bestseller experiment of the two marks, they were almost simultaneously using Scrivener. You can't use it exactly the same time, but there was clearly even one day they would both be at it. But we very much zipped the file up, sent it to each other, had it for a few days or a week or two or however long it was, and then sent it back and forward between ourselves. So we had and I, I thought that was in terms of learning from co-writing, that was a really useful thing. And that we had I had I had defined periods where I had a set task with mm. a deadline. And so I knew exactly what was expected of me in that period of time. And, the, and that the file was mine and nothing else was sort of moving or shifting in the background. 
Yeah, and I think that was important too, especially with the structure, because we we did start out with a table of contents and then we quickly found that the structure moved and then it moved yeah. again as we understood the journey through the book. And although it's a book that people can dip into, you can actually read it cover to cover and get some yeah. kind of journey. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And uh, it, did take a while, it took quite a while to get to that, I think. Um, and and that's the ob ob obviously the awesome thing about Scrivener is it's incredibly easy yeah. to, <laughs> move, to move stuff around. I mean, imagine doing that in a Word document, the pain, if it had all been in a single, it would have just been excruciating. So, um, yeah. yeah, but that was a really bit important bit of getting the, the book right and making it feel it worked. Is I think you can just dip in and you can go into two or three sections and get out what you need from it in terms of your particular problems. But if you really want to do the full you can do the full journey, you can go all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, obviously you're not, I guess you're not someone who's that experienced in book marketing. And now that's where we are in our journey. We're talking about this. So how yeah. are you feeling as someone who basically as a doctor, you're not, you know, you're not usually like talking to readers and all of this type of thing. So how, how, is, how is the whole marketing thing feeling for you? Um, I think, um, I, well, I'm tempted to say nerve wracking and a bit anxiety provoking, but I'm not sure it isn't. I've been listening to a lot of self-publishing and indie and that, those kind of that's in that space podcast for a long time. So I think everything that we've talked about, I'm aware of has been happening and I've seen it in action. And I was a bit like, it's a bit more scary than suddenly being the one who has to do it and actually go through that process. That's obviously a sort of a step, but I knew it was coming. So I was kind of in that regard, um, it certainly just doesn't come as a surprise, but it is beyond, it is slightly beyond my skill set. We've got sort of some aspects of this creep across into my work with medical journals as a sort of, in terms of the media, but actually it's a very sort of um, specific process. So yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone, no question. Mm. And the other thing is you are trying to now position yourself differently. So, and many authors mm. are going through this with their kind of first book in this area. So what are you thinking with your website and what are you now offering for people and how are you trying to use this as more of a platform builder? Yeah, so um, I'm certainly, you know, one of my, my writing has been about health and I'm particularly interested in writing about health now for men and their health. And I think it's a very neglected area and there's far too much emphasis on toned buff bodies and chisel, you know, growing big muscles. And I think actually that's not what most men want. And I, I'm kind of really interested in a kind of um, an evidence-based approach. So um, I'm based at ewanlawson.com, so that's with E-U-A-N. And I'm, I'm offering there a, a free healthy bloke action plan, which is going to be a much more kind of down to earth, but still grounded in the evidence, talking about health and some key areas where people can look at their, men particularly can look at their sleep, exercise, alcohol use. Mm. Uh, their mental health, like loneliness, and such a big issue with men, a bit of weight management as well, and they can um, start making some positive changes. Yeah, I think that's I think that's so good. Um, you know, you and I have talked about this, and I, I think yeah. um, I mean the the healthy writer is very much um, non gender specific. It is you know for everyone, yeah. but yes. your I think your and I've listened to you go backwards and forwards on what you want to do, what you <laughs> want to offer the world. And yeah, yeah. what's so important is you can't be a health person, like you and Lawson, health yeah, yeah. person. You do have to choose a micro niche. And this is what yeah. I want everyone to take away is, you you know, you're, you're, you're going through this process of a micro niche. Um, yeah. and, and that will be the foundation going forward. Yeah, it's so important. And I think that's probably been my problem. And I'm sure a lot of writers have experienced this. It's like the last five or 10 years is a lack of focus. And I actually deciding what you so having so many projects, so many ideas, and then you're getting part of the way through, then stopping them and never taking them on. And so that's kind of actually this, this is that, that kind of requirement to focus on a micro niche and to really work at that. I think um, I, I feel very happy that I've found mine and I'm about to push on with that. But um, I would certainly encourage anyone else that that's the way to, to start thinking about things. Brilliant. Well, we are pretty excited about The Healthy Writer yes. coming out. Um, so you can find, uh, you the listeners, can find uh, the book on all the usual platforms in print and ebook. So where can people find you online? Yeah, so um, best place is to go to my website. So that's ewanlawson.com and that's E-U-A-N-L-A-W-S-O-N.com. And um, everything is there and we'll, you will know, find me at there. Fantastic. Well, it's been an incredible journey. So thank you again, Ewan, for your time. Thank you, Joe.